What's up people, you're watching Cartel TV and I'm Jenny. <sighs> this is going to be tough. Today I have the new Holden Commodore with its most powerful engine in the top trim level, the Calais V. Actually, there is one more trim level above it, the VXR, but I've tried that one and I have to say it's basically just a bit of a sportier version of this car, but only in the sport mode. So, what's tough about having a top spec Commodore? Now this officially Holden Commodore is now built in Germany and is based on the Opel Insignia, but it's just not a real Commodore, is it? Hör mal, ist der Opel Insignia, der wird im guten alten Deutschland gebaut, du. It's smaller, there's no sedan version, no rear wheel drive, no V8. It's definitely not a real Commodore. And the Commodore is as much of a part of the Aussie car industry history as the E-Class is a part of the German. We loved our Commodores. With so many wrong boxes ticked for something called a Commodore, it has got to lose some of its appeal in Australia, at least for a while. Yes, we're going to hate it. But is it a bad car? No, not really. I mean, it's no Commodore, but it's actually pretty good. The car looks wonderfully sleek and these LED matrix headlights work well with the grille. The whole front looks sharp and minimalistic with thin, bright, horizontal details. The hood is also rather clean with discreet side bulges and this elegant line at the front. Honestly, it looks a lot better on this darker colour car. From the side, it has a bit of that four-door coupe flair that Europeans love. And this crease in the door line looks really harmonious with the chrome trim. It actually looks pretty good. Now, I've seen the Tourer also, and that one looks better to me. The hood hides one of three engine options, two of which I've had the chance to drive. The one I have here is a 3.6 litre V6. It has no turbo, and it produces 235 kilowatts of power and 381 newton meters of torque. Not bad, although not lightning fast. The other one I've tried is a two litre turbo with 191 kilowatts and 350 newton meters of torque. It's slower than this one, but I have to say the difference isn't huge. The forced induction makes it far less noticeable. Both of these are paired with a nine-speed automatic. The third one is a diesel option, and I haven't seen that yet, so we'll leave that for a later review. And no, that's not a V8 either. The new Commodore has zero V8 options. Behind the wheel, okay, it's good. Out of the city, it's actually more than good. It's comfortable and refined, and the steering feedback is great. And the seats? Pretty darn good. Australian suspension came from the same people who tuned the Holden cars back in the good old days, when they were made in Australia. And it shows. The new Commodore soaks up our bumps pretty well and gives great feedback in the process. Now, this one with the V6 is all-wheel drive and it packs a wonderful mechanical torque vectoring system. The same one used in the Ford Focus RS and that one is a real pocket rocket. It grips the road perfectly, traction is amazing, and the power delivery is really smooth. As it should be from a naturally aspirated engine. The 2.0-litre entry-level version is front-wheel drive only, and if you want a more spirited ride, the power won't be your problem. Under steel wheel, but it's not really that bad. I mean, it's a sensible family car, it's comfortable, and it handles pretty well. Not worse than any front-wheel drive car, and better than many of them. But not a rear-wheel drive Commodore, damn it. Both of these are paired with a new 9-speed automatic, and I actually really like it. With so many gears, it's always in comfortable revs, in a relaxed drive, and the ride seems effortless. With the pedal to the metal, it shifts quickly and smoothly. Where the V6 matches the old V8 is in its 2,100 kilograms of towing capacity. This is a pleasant surprise. It has a lot of really nice driving features like adaptive cruise control, heads-up display, advanced park assist and rain sensors. On the inside, the new Commodore is nice. It's a bit narrower, so the person in the middle is not going to be as happy as the others. Legroom is decent though. Headroom? Not so much if you're taller. This short and thick armrest has two cup holders. The rear also gets air vents and heaters, and the leather is a great addition. And the front's even better. I've already praised the comfort of the seats, and they also have heating, cooling, and a nice, although subtle, massage feature. They are also eight-way power adjustable and have power slide bolsters. The steering wheel has paddle shifters and is also covered in leather. The interior is a big step up from the last generation. Some of the materials could be slightly more refined, but overall, I really like it. In front of the driver is a customizable LCD display, which has some pretty good looking modes. This trim level has electric sunroof and heads up display, as well as a MyLink 8 inch infotainment system with SatNav, DAB Plus radio, Apple CarPlay, and Android Auto. Now, there's plenty of storage up front nice deep cup holders, wireless charging in the armrest. And I do have to mention this glove box looks like a normal glove box. We open it. You can only use this much. This part 
is completely unfunctional. It's like an oversized sunglass holder. Speaking of storage, the luggage space in the Tora is absolutely amazing. With the seats up, you get 793 litres to the roof and 1,600 when you drop the rear seats. Now, the lift back is smaller, of course, with 552 litres of storage. Now, to get to that storage, you need to press the bottom of this lion's foot and then sort of grasp for something which is really nothing to lift it open. Novelty factor, 10. Practicality factor, two. Drop the second row and you get 1,450. That's really good. The rear seats fold at the push of a button. The new Cal AV has some great safety perks and comes with a reversing camera, AEB, pedestrian detection, lane keep assist, blind spot monitoring, electronic stability control, ABS, EBD, traction control, brake assist, hill start assist, 360 degree camera, advanced park assist, automatic high beam assist, forward collision warning, lane departure warning, distance indicator, side blind zone alert, rear cross traffic alert and rain sensors. All in all, it is a good car. The biggest problem is its name. Why did they call it a Commodore? Holden fans are never gonna fall for it, so why not just start fresh? And to be honest, that's exactly how this car feels. Fresh. It looks a lot more sleek and feels more eloquent and refined to drive. And the interior features have all really been raised a notch or two. But gone is the loud throaty engine option that everyone in the past had known it for. It's as if your typical Bogan got a sleek haircut dressed up in a suit and became such a gentleman that he gave you a massage while you drive. The price for this top spec Commodore Calais is about 57,000 drive away. However, if you can get past the name and really open yourself up to it, you might actually enjoy the new Commodore. I did. Look, the name leaves a bitter taste, but not bitter enough to dismiss it. Thanks for watching Cartel TV. Now tell us your opinions. Has Holden done enough to keep Commodore fans happy? And to make up the fact that this car is no longer manufactured in Australia. We want to know your thoughts. Leave it below and we'll see you next time. Peace.